Se puro research.
everyone. Welcome to tonight's Lung Cancer Living Room. Thank you all for coming. Everyone in the room, everyone signing in online, either through uh, the YouTube live stream or uh, first time ever tonight through our Facebook uh, live stream. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Danielle Hicks. I am uh, from the Bonnie J. Dario Lung Cancer Foundation. My role there is to oversee patient programs and services. So anything that we do that has a direct impact on patients, whether it's support, education, navigation, that sort of thing, is my area of responsibility. I, of course, don't do that all by myself. We have a wonderful team of people um, uh, that I work with that, that do that with us. A couple of them are here tonight. And when we get to introductions, I'll have them uh, kind of stand up and say who they are. So just so that some of you have been here before, so, so welcome back. Um, uh, some of you watch our regularly scheduled program that we do from California on the third Tuesday of every month. Uh, so um, it's nice to see those of you, Mara, who, who do tune in all the way from Florida to watch on a monthly base basis. We're happy to say this is our third year back in, um, in South Florida uh, with this wonderful team of doctors who come in and uh, agree to sit down and just have sort of a real conversation with you all about this disease, where we are, where we're going, and what it means to you. So um, what I'm going to do is ask, I, I was going to ask that we turn off the cell phones, but we already did that. I want to encourage you guys, um, if you haven't participated before, you don't know how this works, to ask questions throughout. Please don't stay silent. Don't think you need to hold your questions till the end. Um, we do this for you. Uh, there, there are no stupid questions, um, so please feel free. A lot of times I hear patients say, well, I don't want to make this meeting all about me. At the end of the day, because of the people watching live and the ones that will come back and watch it post live, there may be questions that other people have too, and they will be able to get the answers, um, if, but only if you ask them. So please, please, please ask, ask questions. If you did not sign in with us, um, please, when the meeting's over, sign in the sign in sheet so that way when we do come back to South Florida, you guys know we're here, and if you're available, we can uh, come say hi. Um, and with that, I'm going to start with what we call the around the room. So anybody in the room who would like to introduce themselves, say who they are, where they're from, it is not mandatory. You certainly don't have to do it. Um, we would love to hear from you. It helps, um, it helps our, our panelists to kind of be able to tailor their talk to the people that they're talking to. So um, I'm actually going to ask Mara to start because she's standing. She, I, well, you're sitting right here. Um, and then once we go through that, I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves as well and to, um, tell us a little bit about why they chose lung cancer as an area of special. Hi, my name is Mara. I'm from Jupiter here in Florida. I was diagnosed in 2013 with non-small cell. Um, I had a lung lobectomy and chemo at the time, stage 2B, 3A, kind of discrepancy with that. And then in 2015, I had another primary in the other lung, and I had a wedge resection done. I do have a couple of nodules that are being carefully monitored, and so far I'm stable. And I just want to say this foundation is amazing. I don't know where I would have been when I was first diagnosed without them. Going online is all doom and gloom, as I'm sure many of you know, and the knowledge I have acquired from just this foundation is, I, I don't even have words to explain. Actually, <laughs> I, I look forward to the meetings every month to find out all the new developments. And the Bonnie J. Adario Foundation is on top of them all. So anybody listening, tune in every month. They're amazing. Anybody else? You can go around the table, probably. So. I'm Arlene Novick. In December of last year, I was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Uh, the first therapy pill I was on was disastrous. I was very, very sick from it. Uh, I have fluid around my lungs, and thanks to Dr. Block, who put in a, a, a drainer, uh, I have no more fluid around my lung. And uh, thanks to Dr. Reyes, he changed my uh, therapy pill. I am just feeling wonderful. And uh, I feel I'm, I'm beating it. I'm, you know, I'm surviving. Great. Hey. 
My name is uh, David. Uh, I was diagnosed uh, eight and a half years ago with uh, stage four lung cancer. And um, today I'm, I have no, uh, nothing in my lungs, but uh, you know, I have some in my brain, but it's, it's under control, thank God. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with lung cancer almost three years ago. Um, I had um, brain radiation. Um, one of my tumors, because it was um, a stage four lung cancer, it metastasized to the brain. Uh, one of the tumors was removed uh, the, almost three years ago. I'm on chemo pills since then, and I had a second surgery on January this year, and uh, I had um, I have seizures on my left leg, and I've been treated at Memorial with Dr. Hunis, and I feel great. I'm a survivor for three years. Okay. Come on, Mr. Morgenstern, don't be, don't be shy. Okay, I'm 96 years old. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that, that, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is... I want to use his car, the Jaguar. Yes. He wants to drive my car, yeah. <laughs> no, the most important thing is Mr. Morgenstern fought in which war? World War II. World War II. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Over the European Theater of Operations, yeah. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, well, I uh, was diagnosed with cancer. I couldn't believe it. I said, I, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm playing tennis and I'm doing all these things. And they said, we found that spot on you. Okay. And, and uh, they gave me a cyber knife. And that didn't uh, work out too well because they wanted to give me another dose, but it was too close to my heart. And we went to the... Uh, <clears throat> what do we got using now? The uh, immunization. Immunotherapy. Right. And so far it's uh, a little cough here and there, but uh, I'm okay. Except that I'm 96. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't want to give it up. You got more to say. Sweet. My name is Karen. I was diagnosed three years ago. My tumor was inoperable, um, so I began 16 months of chemo I endured. I also had cyber knife. The chemo did not, was not effective in shrinking my tumor, but the cyber knife took care of it. And um, along the way, I've discovered other things. So I am now, I, I had a second tumor, which was also treated with cyber knife, and it's given me a bit of a cough, but I still play tennis every day. Mm -hmm. And I um, was here last year and I questioned the good doctors about cannabis and why nobody's using it. Um, so I started using it so far so good and I'm doing other things as well. My next question, which I hope the panel will address, is the beginnings of the use of stem cell therapy, which is being used for everything else. So, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on with that with regard to lung cancer? Thank you. Great. Hi, I'm Scott Stream. I'm from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, I don't know, it's kind of a long story with, my, with me. About 15 years ago, I, was, I had a tumor, but it was non-cancerous, -can as, they, as they thought at that time. They did biopsies. They said, well, we're just going to monitor it. Um, then about two years ago, um, they saw a little nodule next to the tumor, and they said, we got to look at this, but it might be this, and it might be, you know, it was, you know, it was the lymph nodes infected, but maybe whatever, and they played back and forth at the, at the doctor that I originally went to. Um, and then they, insurance has changed and so forth. I went to an, the next doctor. Oh, I forgot one stage in there. 
Um, I also have what's called Kaplan syndrome, which then turned into rheumatoid arthritis, which is your white blood cells attacking your cartilage, um, which then it also doesn't attack the cancer like it should, which they, which they put me on Humira, which also kills your immune system, which then gave an open door for the cancer. So two years ago, they finally, they said this, that, whatever, and then last year, near the end of last year, they, they, they did a biopsy, um, it took three weeks for the results to come back because it's a rare cancer. It's called neuro, neuro endocrine cancer, which is chemotherapy resistant, even high doses, <clears throat> in my right lung. So they, they went to a, a board of surgeons and, and oncologists, and they said, the only thing we can do is remove it. So they said, we'll try to remove the upper part of the lung. And, and they went in and they said, well, let's take the whole thing out while we're there. So they took my entire right lung out. Luckily, I never smoked, so my left lung is doing okay. And as you can see, I'm still talking, um, which is a good sign. So I guess uh, two weeks from now, I'm gonna go back to my six month, uh, see what's going on appointment, which gets me a little bit nervous. Because I'm from hearing you know, what's going on with cancer, it likes to spread when you cut. And oh, they, they removed 39 lymph nodes and four of them were positive for cancer. So we'll see what happens. Hey. My name is uh, Robert Di Pasquale. <clears throat> I'm a newbie here. We got about five weeks into this, so I just found out that I have lung cancer, uh, stage four, and it metastasized to my spine. So, Dr. Reyes and his team, I think I've got a great shot listening to everybody here. It's really uh, uplifting. So I'm looking forward to going through everything. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Alan. I live in Hollywood. And uh, I was diagnosed about eight months ago. And uh, I had a short term of radiation I don't know that it did anything for me, but right away, Dr. Hunas said, let's get you on immunotherapy. And uh, thank God for Keytruda. I, uh, the tumor is shrinking. Oh, so it metastasized to my vertebrae, my fifth vertebrae. And um, he said the tumor is shrinking now. And uh, it, let's just keep going in this direction. It looks great. And uh, so that's it. I'm just going forward. Right. Great. Good evening. My name is John Lamont. I'm from Pembroke Pines. Uh, Dr. Reyes and I visit each other every six months. I'm under his, his care. Six years ago, I was, uh, had lung cancer on my top part of my lung that was removed by Dr. Tarazi. And unfortunately, the year later, they found something on my right side that was very, very depressing to have. But uh, to talk about the compassion and the concern of these doctors, at that point in time, I told Dr. Reyes I didn't want to give any more of my body away. So they took my tonsils out. <laughs> That's it. Well, he walked me over to Dr. Anna Patero. And from that time, we did uh, the cyber knife on the right-hand side. She found the right radiologist to go in and do the thing that they had to do. Uh, it's a total of six years now. Uh, most of the time it's upbeat, and I'd like to thank, thank, thank the doctors who've taken such good care of us. You're amazing people. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Philip Ferrari. One morning I woke up, didn't feel good. My family took me to the uh, family doctor. He referred me to a lung specialist. Guess what? I got cancer. Perfect me got cancer. <laughs> never accepted it, never will accept it. However, I got it. Before I knew it, my son-in-law Murray took me to Memorial West, and you know something? They saved my life. 
I'm not being dramatic, they saved my life. Dr. Reyes, I'm looking at you, and your beautiful staff made me well. I do everything that I did before. I found that miserable thing on my lung. Lung, it's gone. I feel great. And thank you, Doctor, and Memorial West. Thank you, everybody, for, for, for sharing your stories. Um, it's very inspiring to hear all of you um, uh, share them with us. As, as, and one of the things I love most about the living room here, um, and again, the one we do back in California, is that th there's this insane ability to bring laughter into the room. And I think it's, it's such a huge part of, of healing and, and coping and dealing. So, so thank you all for sharing. Uh, I, I did hear somebody mention Dr. Block and Dr. Botero. Um, both of whom are running late, um, so hopefully they'll be able to make it, but we're going to go ahead and start without them. And with that, I'm going to start with Dr. Santos because he's standing right to my right and ask him to introduce himself and give a little brief why, why lung cancer um, is your choice of specialty. And then uh, after that, I'm going to ask Dr. Reyes to take it from there. Yeah, hi, my name is Dr. Edgardo Santos. Uh, I am the medical director of cancer research for uh, Lean Cancer Institute in Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, former faculty member at uh, University of Miami and also Tulane University. I started my career um, in medicine back in 1994. Uh, sorry, in 1994 I finished medicine. I started my medical career in 1988, and so it has been a long journey. Uh, graduated from the medical school, University of Panama, um, and then I did uh, my internship and residency, part of my residency in internal medicine in Panama, came here to USA uh, at the mid 1990s and did everything again here at Jackson Memorial Hospital. And then from there, the, the rest is just a story. Uh, why I choose um, lung cancer? Well, uh, initially in my career, I was looking to do hematology. Uh, I did, um, when I was a medical student, uh, I remember that I was in the hematology floor helping people with leukemia and lymphoma. And I said, when, when, I, when I graduate, I will, I will be a hematology. And came here to USA, uh, was not planning to do oncology, but then somehow I ended up uh, doing research, even since early, on my, almost my second day of internship with Dr. Rice. And uh, he had one of our best mentors at University of Miami. Uh, he, he passed away. Uh, from no Hodgkin lymphoma, by the way, when I was a fellow in Himok uh, under my care. And he was a mentor for us. And then I started to do research in lung cancer. And I started to understand uh, how the disease is so devastating, um, the things, how the, phys the patients go through with this, this problem, this disease, uh, how difficult it's not only for the patient, but also for the family. And if we don't move fast, sometimes the patient they don't make it. So every time I, I, I meet a new patient, uh, I see a challenge in front of me. And as I always tell my patient, my job is either to cure you, and if I cannot cure you, it's at least to make your life easier, with good quality of life, and then the rest is God. And, uh, and I learned that since the beginning. And I'm telling you, I have a good mentor on Dr. Rice, and we have done so many things together, and we continue doing research together. And we don't quit. I mean, sometimes he's here in the south, I am in the north. And we always uh, share ideas and new things. How can we, <laughs> how can we improve? OK? And, and we, we are not quitters. So we always tend to, to look for something new, something innovative, something that, that we can bring to the table to our patient. And that's how I end up doing thoracic oncology. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so good evening. Um, my name is Estela Rodriguez. I'm the medical director of thoracic oncology at Mount Sinai. So we're in Miami Beach in Aventura. And so honored to be here with you for the first time. Um, so I decided to uh, work in lung cancer 
uh, because I had great mentors. So I went to the University of Pennsylvania, and Corey Langer and Tracy Evans were researchers that were working in lung cancers and doing very exciting things for patients uh, with targeted therapies. So I thought that the science and the, the relationships that we were having with patients really moved me. Um, but it wasn't until I had a friend. Um, I had a young friend who was uh, 33. Uh, who had out positive lung cancer and she was diagnosed. She was in my knitting group when I was training and it was really touched me to see how lung cancer is affecting younger people, people who never smoked. Um, so I have done research on looking at ways that lung cancer presents in women and very interested in finding better ways to provide screening for patients because we definitely have a long ways to go to diagnose lung cancer earlier in more people so that we can cure them. But anyway, great to be here. <laughs> well, my name is Luis Raez. I'm the uh, Chief of Hematology Oncology and the Medical Director of Memorial Cancer Institute in uh, South uh, Broward. We have, as you know, six hospitals there. We are a public health care system. And uh, we want to give thanks to the Bonia Dario Lung Cancer Foundation, you know, for coming to South Florida to help us to fight this uh, difficult disease. You know, they came four years ago. And I think it's uh, public knowledge that Mrs. Bonia Dario is a cancer survivor. She survived lung cancer, and she's putting her whole life, her family, you know, Danielle is a daughter of Mrs. Dario. Everybody works on this to fight cancer. And that's why we found her on her uh, uh, the, the right person to connect and collaborate because we need more help for lung cancer. Uh, uh, many, more, many things can be done if we get uh, more resources and more help. I personally do lung cancer since 2001. I graduated in University of Miami. I'm from Peru, but I came to Miami. And in um, 2001, as Dr. Santos said, we had the opportunity to meet a great guy, a great mentor for all of us. He was the lung cancer director in University of Miami. And uh, he never quit. He always was looking for, even in the most difficult circumstances when the patients were failing treatment, he always looked for a new therapy, a new protocol, a new clinical trial, something outside the box. And Dr. Santos and I learned very well about that. We were very inspired. And as we tell the patients, you know, you never quit. And, uh, and his life is an example. He died. His patients survived him. And his patients are still alive. I have patients that are from him that are still alive now, 18 years later, that they still follow me. But that means, tells you that, you know, you never lose hope because as Dr. Santos said, uh, for the ones that we believe in God, at the end of the day, it's whatever he, want, he decides for you, and uh, we do our best, and, uh, and we are trying to be an instrument, and, uh, and that's what we do, and we do our best to fight for our patients. So, and it's a pleasure to work with Dr. Santos and Dr. Estela May Rodriguez. You know, we are South Florida colleagues. We are lung cancer experts, and we're here to serve you tonight. And, you know, I know that sometimes we're very busy. We don't answer your questions, but tonight we have two hours, whatever you need to ask. And I encourage also the family to talk. The caregiver is a very important part of this. And I know that you guys have a hard time. A lot of you suffer a lot. And you don't say sometimes anything because you cannot, you don't want to upset the patient. But whatever you, we can do for you also, we are here. Thank you. to support you, to answer your questions, to be here for you, and to work as a team. And uh, I wish you um, to gain your strength and, uh, and find answers for your disease. And I'm pretty sure that together we have a better outcome than by ourselves. Great. Dr. Patero is just walking in, so I don't know if you want to let her introduce herself before you start. Okay. On? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's okay. Okay, we Dr. Botero is going to introduce herself, and um, you already have a microphone. So I don't need this. Yeah. 
Um, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Ana Botero. I'm a radiation oncology from Memorial. Okay. Yeah. That, she's not a mic. She just needs to have to project a little bit. Okay. Um, my name is Ana Botero. I'm radiation oncology from Memorial West uh, Hospital, and I work with uh, Dr. Uh, Luis Reyes and others um, as a multidisciplinary team. Um, I graduated from Washington University in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, in my prior life, I used to be a surgeon. And now I have been in practice for 15 years. My main interest, uh, or one of my main interests is in lung cancer, um, specifically a stage, any type of a stage, but uh, mostly a stage four combination of immunotherapy and uh, radiation therapy with uh, specifically stereotactic radiation therapy, meaning target radiation therapy with high doses in a very short um, course of uh, treatment, one, three, or five uh, treatments, treating the primary tumor or treating the metastasis. Thank you. Okay, so um, as I said, this is about you guys, it's about the patients, and on purpose we don't have a lecture. You know, we don't want to bother you with the slides and more lectures if this is an opportunity to share. Um, if you want to ask specific questions about topics that are or your interest from you or your family, and if not, we can talk a little bit about topics that are important for all of you. And, uh, but uh, please feel free to interrupt because uh, uh, it's about you, as I said. So, so if you have questions or concerns. For example, uh, the lady was asking about stem cell therapy. So uh, why we don't do stem cell therapy for lung cancer yet? No, is it? Yeah, it's still. Uh, huh? No, it's still investigational uh, thing in, in lung cancer. Um, uh, there was a paper um, last uh, year by Paul Bond, Dr. Mina, um, Dr. Gazdar, um, addressing the issue of stem cell in, in lung cancer. And we need to be very careful because uh, even though it seems to work, you know, in different other diseases, it doesn't mean that it will work for, for, for lung cancer. So I think that we need to wait for uh, better studies, you know, to uh, make an impact in what we are looking for, which is to improve the survival of our patient. Uh, and so I think that uh, in lung cancer, it is still ongoing, so we need to wait in that, in that sense. No, and also, for example, uh, stem cell therapy, you know, bone marrow transplant, basically what we do is we give a doses of chemo so high that we kill the cancer, but we kill the bone marrow and then we rescue the patient given a bone marrow from itself or for herself or himself that was a storage or a bone marrow from somebody else to rescue the patient so the patient don't die. But you know, that type of therapy is very raw. You know, it's very, how you say, hopefully primitive one day because you kill the whole body yeah. to do that. And then of course you rescue them. Hopefully nowadays with the new technologies that we have, we can find other ways to solve the problem. Even the people that does stem cell therapy now, they do what they call CAR T cells. You know, these people that treat leukemia and lymphoma, they now have, uh, they take your T cells, they put uh, like a bomb in the engineering, and then they send it back to kill the cancer. So they don't have to kill the whole bone marrow. That's what we hope that we're we gonna have to put you guys on that, uh, because now, thanks to immunotherapy, target therapy, we have other, other op options. Yeah, on CAR T, on CAR -T cell, uh, studies are starting in, in other centers uh, for solid tumors. So, you know, as Dr. Reyes said, the uh, indication is for ALL. Uh, there are like two or three different companies that they are producing that. But now that uh, the time to move that into the solid tumor, solid tumor spa, uh, space, not only lung cancer, is already in place in the different universities and the program are going to start. Or well, they already started. I have another question. Here. Yes, are there any studies being funded now for official studies, formal studies for the stem cell therapy? Or is it just not funded because Big Pharma has no money in it? So that's my question. What happened is, as, as I was trying to tell you, uh, stem cell therapy uh, exists since the 1965, 70s. So we already, for example, have tried stem cell therapy for uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumors. We have tried stem cell therapy for testicular tumors, a lot of solid tumors. And as I said, because the approach is a little bit rough, you have to kill the tumor that and con, con, uh, cause considered damage to the patient, and then you have to practically resuscitate the patient, 
hopefully we don't have to pass to that route. You know, we can do maybe this process. For example, we give immunotherapy, we don't risk your life. Only three or five percent of you are risking their life because immunotherapy can cause damage. When we do stem cell therapy, maybe half of the patients may not survive. You know, that's why hopefully we'll find other ways to fix this, this disease without going that way. And that's why we have the, the other options, you know. Yeah, the idea of stem cell is to replace what has been already damaged. It's not only for, for cancer, you know, it's for the heart, for people that have like a knee replacement and stuff like that, that they went to for a stem cell. You have to replace a damaged tissue because the stem cell had the potential to get back to the patient or to the human being what has been lost. But, the, the, but one thing is when you deal with only one organ and a benign condition, and the other thing is when we are dealing with something that is malignant in which we know I'm pretty sure that you already read how difficult it is to control cancer because of all the pathologic, uh, all the pathways that are involved. That's why it's so difficult. Um, one of the things that we, we, we face in lung cancer, you have to give an idea, is this mutation that, that we find like KRAS. I mean, KRAS is still, with all the research that we have done, still we don't have any drug approved by the FDA because KRAS is like a, 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 a train center in which you have a lot of train coming in and trains coming out. So which one we are going to target? So that's how difficult it is to, to deal, uh, not only with lung cancer, with every can, kind of cancer because the uh, oncogenic pathway are so diverse. So is a stem cell will be the answer for that. That's why we need good clinical trials and we'll see. Yeah, I think that's a very, um, I think that's a very exciting part of doing thoracic oncology now that um, we have learned that lung cancer are, are as diverse as the people here. So like some of you have cancers that are molecularly targeted, some are, have high mutation burdens, some are very sensitive to the immune system. And I think that um, we are now, instead of picking like one therapy for all patients, we can now do better by selecting therapies that you will do better with. So it's changing all the time, although we do have some challenges with KRAS, immunotherapy has bypassed some of that mm -hmm. and has made it better. We have a question there. So, yeah, can a stem cell regrow my right heart? I mean, my right lung, I'm kidding. Um, immunotherapy uh, treatment, um, it, it reprograms the white blood cells, correct? If my understanding is correct? The T cells, yeah. Program. So it re okay. How, on the studies that, that have been done, does that, Will that work for rheumatoid arthritis? Or retrains them to stop attacking your cartilage huh. and to go after okay, things that are supposed worse. to? No. Yeah. Yeah, it don't. yeah, no, no, yeah. Uh, yeah. So on, immune, on immunotherapy, what we have done is the following. So everything is in the category of what we call checkpoint inhibitor. So the checkpoint inhibitor, there are many of them. But one of them in particular is the one that you are getting, some of you are getting, which is the PD-1 and the PDL one well, again, this is only one part of the checkpoint inhibitor. And then the checkpoint inhibitor is only one part of the big umbrella of immunotherapy. So you have pathway that augments the immune system, okay, which is one of them is the checkpoint inhibitor, and the other one are some pathway which shut down the immune system. So to avoid uh, diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, there need to be a balance between the immune, uh, the, the, the thing that is reactive versus the one that inhibits, okay? And when that balance exists, patients, they don't have autoimmune disease. Now, to answer your question, uh, medication like the P, uh, PD-1 and the PDL one which are checkpoint inhibitors, they will make the rheumatoid arthritis worse. And that's why patients that are getting, uh, for example, this medication complain of joint pain, arthritis, because those medications, what they do is, they do not reprogram the white cell. You, the white cell of the patient, the T cell, remain the same. It's just that we remove the inhibition that a cancer cell made on top of the T cell. So we remove that inhibition, and now the, T, the same T cell is able to recognize the tumor cell as a foreign antigen, and then can kill the tumor. So there is, no, no, there is no, nothing to reprogram anything. It's the same, it's the same T cell. Uh, uh, the, the T cell is, is working, but because of uh, signaling, that the tumor put in top of the T cell, the T cell cannot do anything. So what we do is just to remove that. So also it's very dangerous. Like for example, I only have one lung now. And that's slowly, like because I have one lung, if I get pneumonia, I'm not a candidate for that immunotherapy. No, you are a candidate for that immunotherapy. It's just that, uh, well, 
Number one, be, be, before we put patients on immunotherapy, we need to see what are the risk factors that you may develop. For example, in your case, and you consider inflammation of the lung, we call that pneumonitis. So we need to go through the, the history of your past, what kind of diseases you have before, what kind of, uh, if you have any autoimmune disease ongoing, if you are taking any kind of immunosuppressant, or if you have been exposed to radiation therapy before, if you have been exposed to uh, EGFR or ALK, those TKI inhibitor, because we know that those patients that have been exposed to those kind of medications may have a little bit more susceptibility to develop down the line pneumonitis. But still, the rates are so low that we, if you needed it, we, all of us will probably ch go forward with immunotherapy. And even with rheumatoid arthritis, we have had uh, plenty, pa plenty of patients that we've been able to manage with low doses of prednisone and treatment. And even when the exacerbations of the rheumatoid arthritis were so bad that we had to stop, we, people had an immune response that they build and a memory response that controls the cancer. So, um, you know, it's a case by case. We're learning to do this case by case. Yeah, yeah, the toxicity, as Dr. Estela um, Mari Rodriguez said, is uh, very low. When, when, we, when you have a side effect, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, whatever, you go by grade one, grade two, three, and four. Three and four are the worst one, and usually the patient end up in the hospital. The rate of those uh, problems when we put immunotherapy on board, such as nivolumab, tesolizumab, durvalumab, uh, pembrolizumab, okay? All those medications, the rate is very low. Uh, the three and four percent, the, the, the grade three and four is like two, three percent, no more than that. And in most of the cases, less than one percent. So that's a good part. So there is no question, as she said, that when we deal with someone that needs immunotherapy, uh, the, to the tolerability of immunotherapy is beyond of what kind of toxicity the patient will face if go into chemotherapy. And on top of that, remember, most of the study now in lung cancer has been positive for, for the most important thing which is overall survival, because what we are here is to improve the survival and make the, our patient live longer with good quality of life. So that is what a checkpoint inhibitor has brought now into the table, not only in lung cancer, in many other cancers. You have a question there? Yes. Um, I know that there must be an overlap between many different types of cancer, like adenocarcinoma and melanoma. And the treatments sometimes are reflective. One is the same as the other. For instance, hemorrhoid is for both. Um, is a melanoma also affected by PDL level? Uh, yes. Yes. What happened is um, uh, we we classify the tumors based on our science. Sure. But for example, a hundred years ago, there were uh, liquid tumors and solid tumors, mm -hmm. and then you have hematologists and oncologists. And today, we join together because cancer can be in the blood, can be in the in the solid. At the end of the day, and then, and then we divide it by organs. You said cancer from the lung, cancer from the liver, et cetera. But at the end of the day, the cancer is not an organ. It's something molecular. It's something genetic. And so that's why, for example, uh, the reason why we join hematology and oncology is because, for example, there is a disease called uh, Burkitt lymphoma. Sometimes the disease likes to show up as a mass, and then in all times, oh, yeah, I call the oncologist. Sometimes the disease shows as a liquid, leukemia. It's the same disease, the same uh, genetic abnormality. So what matters at the end of the day is to shut down that bad gene. Doesn't matter if it's liquid, solid, whatever. And that's what was happening now. When we were trained, you know, we, I was trained as a lung cancer doctor. You know, we have the three of us, the five of us actually, because she's a radiation oncologist, she's a navigator, she's a surgeon. All of us are trained in oral. But for example, there is a drug that is going to be approved soon that we have, a, we use in memorial called larotrectinib. It's a drug that targets a genetic anormality called TREK, like Star Trek. That genetic anormality exists in lung cancer, colon cancer, sarcoma of the kids. So, and that genetic anormality causes different types of tumor. But when you shut down that gene, all of these cancers get cured. So that's why we are shifting the paradigm. You know, that's what Dr. Estela Mari was talking about molecular diagnosis. In the future, maybe we will not be experts by organs, you know. We will dedicate ourselves to shut down all of these bad genes with genetic therapy. And that is what I'm doing. Some of you are taking pills that target specific genes. And our job is to try to develop more drugs to target more genes to kill more cancers, you know. Sorry. Uh, 
regarding Pembro, is there any long-term statistics on survival rate mm -hmm. with Pembro with high PDL level? Yeah, if you well, yeah, well go ahead. No, well, um, I, I want to back a little bit for job. I want to answer your question, but the PDL one differ also from tumor to tumor because you mentioned long and melanoma. Okay, in some tumor types, we don't check for PDL one. Melanoma is one of them. The PDL one is irrelevant. Also in head and neck, because those patients will respond to the immunotherapy. But there are some tumor types which are less immunogenic that they don't like to share the antigens to the immune system. And, in, and because of that, uh, at least in lung cancer, we depend on pd one and other biomarkers to see which patient will do well or not on immunotherapy. So there are two tumors that are very immunogenic. One is uh, melanoma, the other one is kidney cancer. Those, do, those are very well handled with other medications before we knew about the checkpoint inhibitor. Now, to answer your question about the Pembro, remember, nivolumab was the first drug approved uh, in USA and perhaps in the world, uh, no more than that. March 2015, okay, it's more than three years. But it takes time to see how long those patients will, will live. But what, what I can tell you is that in the latest, in the latest uh, clinical trial on first line, okay, first line, using pembrolizumab, which is Keytruda, uh, with chemotherapy in combination, you can see the, a big difference between the triplet, okay, using immunotherapy versus the chemotherapy, and at the end of the tail of survival, you can, you can start to see a, a plateau. Okay, and plateau means that since that no pe people are not dying, thank God. Okay, so, but I think it's too prematurely uh, still to, to see how much will be the overall survival at five years. I think that that data doesn't exist yet. Okay, but it looks very encouraging, very encouraging because this, uh, when you have a chance, you go to the, the internet and, and look for Keynote, Keynote 189. That's one of my favorite clinical trials because uh, that, that clinical trial basically uh, you can, uh, every single patient that was placed on the triplet did well on overall survival, progression-free survival, and the response rate in comparison with the other one. So I think people ask me uh, in my clinic, like yesterday and today, like, will I have a chance to cure? When I have a stage four patient, I say, no. Now, I don't say no. I say, I don't know. That's my answer. Because I have a patient with a stage four in complete remission using immunotherapy alone. So I don't know. But we do know that most patients, like, you're, like you people here, like are living lung cancer like a chronic disease. And that is a, a whole change. You know, mo, most of, in the past, it didn't, it didn't used to be like that. It, patients, some patients will never see a thoracic oncologist. They will be sent by their primary care doctors to hospice. And I hope that never happens in this day because we have better tools. So I think yeah, when I answered that question, I, you know, I, had a, I have a young patient who got his cycle 67 of nivolumab yesterday, and you know, he, he's going forward. I think someone mentioned it, you just keep going forward. And we're, being, we're surprising, like our patients are being surprised that people are living longer. Yeah, I, saw, mm -hmm. uh, I agree with them. You know that also the, for, for Keytruda, maybe we don't have a long-term data. And uh, we used to treat what was our, 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 set on, our mind setting was this is stage four patients that are not going to get cured. However, from the original uh, for Nivoluma, for Odivo, it's already five years since the first group of patients got the drug, and 16% uh, of them are alive with no treatment. You know, in the original uh, Odivo study, uh, they treated for two years, and after that, the people that was stable, they leave them alone. And five years later, one of every six is alive with no progression. That that means that we cure them? We don't know, you know. Uh, lung cancer is a fast-growing tumor, so if it's quiet for five years, it's probably because it's gone. So that's why nowadays we're not telling that there is stage four is incurable anymore because we have seen all of these amazing stories, you know. Unfortunately, one of our, my patients couldn't come here. She's taking a pill for eight years. I already told her three years ago, don't take the pill anymore because she's probably cured, you know. Um, but we, we're not supposed to, we're not just to cure people, but now since to this target therapy, immunotherapy, we're curing people. We don't know how many, and uh, we don't know still, we don't know how long the therapy has to be. Uh, for example, with immunotherapy, usually after two years, a lot of patients, we give them a break and see what happens, um, but there is no standard yet. And, 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 and let me add that this patient that, that Dr. Rice is mentioning, those patients were, Pre-treated pre before, 
or heavily predicted, those patients that were on a nivolumab study uh, initially, they were second line or above. They did not receive nivolumab on first line. Like I, I have similar patients like you, Esther Amari, um, getting the 67, 68, 70. One of the original one from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, she moved from New York, came to my hands, and she continued on that, and I modified the regimen so far, and uh, the, the CAT scan done this week are completely clean, and she have liver disease, metastas metastasis to the liver, uh, and this nivo was third line, no first line, third line, and she's on remission for more than three years. So, yeah. So that's why I say no, I don't know. Yeah. I just want to comment something uh, that is kind of uh, from our end, from radiation oncology, very interested. It's just as a radiation oncology, we're trained basically to treat locally, especially in these patients, only um, uh, when patient has pain or when the tumor do not respond, was rapidly growing or pathological fracture or post-obstructive pneumonia that was causing symptoms. And typically, basically, the patient continue immunotherapy, target therapy, or chemotherapy. But um, at some point, we notice two phenomena. One, that uh, if for some reason we treat in a subset of the patients at stage four, name it 15, 20% of them, that if we treat one of the lesions for whatever reason, palliative treatment, uh, the others start disappearing. So this is a phenomenon that we call the abscopal effect that uh, we are kind of now trying to exploit uh, and take advantage of that. Doesn't happen to absolutely everybody, but that's how radiation um, is now uh, showing that has some um, effect in the immune system, meaning it's like a kill the tumor, release the antigens into the system, into the micro um, environment of the tumor, and all these kind of uh, dendritic cells and T cells and everything get activated and go at distance and attack the other side of malignant tumors. So that's one thing. And second thing is uh, radiation also has been noticed in studies that were first uh, in animals, then uh, uh, phase one looking for toxicity, and then now phase two, phase three, um, that has a, a synergistic effect with the immunotherapy and the target therapy. Meaning if we can combine them, because it's easy to combine chemotherapy with radiation therapy for seven weeks. How often do you give the chemotherapy? Once a week, every three weeks, radiation Monday through Friday, 15 minutes every day for seven weeks, right? That's very easy to combine. But when you start thinking about radiation as a single treatment for um, a long lesion or three or five treatments, because that is uh, in essence the stereotactic or what we call the um, SBRT, um, then we start thinking, okay, the immunotherapy is how often or how we're going to combine if we truly believe in these studies that we see nowadays with excellent results. Um, are we going to give the immunotherapy before and then the stereotactic and then the immuno? And what is the time frame? So those studies are now looking uh, not only, is, they are very specific, not only with certain, you know, for prostate, for lung, for breast, but mostly for lung. Um, they are looking at that, that interval of time, looking at uh, those, um, those proteins in blood that we, they know that they're uh, involved in the cascade of the apoptosis or the necrosis or the killing of the malignant cells to see when they are going up in blood, meaning it could be 24 hours, 48 hours. The average in general um, has been noticed that it's minimal of four days. Um, and to see what is the perfect combination, immuno, stereotactic, and then more continue with the immuno. And what are the numbers of um, metastases that we are supposed to be treating with certain benefit for the patient? Obviously, if the patient comes multiple, multiple uh, metastases, we are not going to just start treating like a crazy, you know, like a everything, like a, a one by one. But has been described in the literature that depending on the number of lesions, uh, we call it oligometastasis. Probably you have heard about that term, that is few metastases or limited number of metastases. We started with three, now we're in six. So we know now, for uh, based on studies phase two, phase three, uh, that if we treat aggressively, meaning aggressively treat it, treat it, and don't wait for the pain, don't wait, just basically you're diagnosed, start with the immunotherapy, obviously the systemic therapy, and then refer the patient to radiation oncology for treat one by one, um, up to six lesions. Uh, could be what we call uh, synchronous, meaning that they present all at the same time, or it could be metachronous, meaning that um, uh, in a more of uh, six months difference, you present with two, then six months later come. I call them a frequent flyer because as, uh, as they said, we have patients now 10 years 
um, that every six months or every year, they come with one or two new lesions. And we call also oligoprogression sometimes because the pets can come back that everything responds, but one is more um, persistent. We also treat those. The good thing about stereotactic radiation therapy is that it's ridiculously low side effects. Basically, no surgery, no anesthesia, very precise, very convenient. Patients can drive themselves. Minimal toxicity, depending what we're treating, brain or whatever, is uh, maybe a little bit of fatigue, a little bit of um, um, uh, headaches, or a little bit of discomfort in the chest, or a little bit of, um, if it's close to the ribs, some chondritis. But very seldom we see more um, severe side effects, like a refracture, for example. That's not really that common. Now, it's highly well, well, uh, well tolerated. And uh, talking about the toxicity, the combination, that sy uh, synergistic effect, uh, has showed that the side effects are relatively very low. So we are going, in, I think, in the right um, path. But just keep in mind that um, it's a process. And even radiation oncologists that work in the community many times, they, they know the benefit of stereotactic, but they are not in the top of um, you know, this new data. And they may say, well, if the patient doesn't have pain, if the patient has no pathological fracture, there's no need for radiation, which is case by case, again, um, not true. OK, great. So we are going to take advantage now that we have Dr. Mark Block. Uh, he is our leader of the Thoracic Oncology Program Memorial Cancer Institute. Um, to introduce him and ask him to maybe uh, talk a little bit, we want to ch have a break from immunotherapy. So <laughs> while you, you think well, so I want to ask him to talk about the most important thing. You realize that um, with all everything that we're saying, we cure maybe 15% or 20% of the cancers. But now we have the advantage to save a lot of people by screening. So Dr. Mark Bloch is a, a champion of screening. I want him to inform us a little bit about the importance of uh, lung cancer screening. Uh, thanks, Luis. I apologize for uh, being late. I guarantee you, if you schedule me for something three or four months in advance and I clear my schedule, there will be an emergency that <laughs> day. So I apologize for being late. Um, <clears throat> As Dr. Reyes alluded to, uh, lung cancer screening is something that we are now actively trying to promote. Uh, you're all familiar with mammography of breast cancer screening, you know, colonoscopy for colon cancer screening, PSAs for prostate. Uh, and up until very recently, uh, we were frustrated in our attempts to try and detect lung cancer early. The challenge, of course, is that you need to be accurate. Um, you want to be able to pick up an early lung cancer and identify that patient and treat them, uh, but not wind up doing a lot of invasive tests with potential complications on people who do not have lung cancer. And uh, for years, we tried a variety of things, chest x-rays, sputum cytology, and so forth. And it wasn't really until the development of the CAT scan, which has such high resolution, uh, that we really had the promise of detecting lung cancers early. Uh, and there's been a lot of controversy until uh, the publication of this huge uh, NIH-sponsored trial several years ago, uh, the National Lung Screening Trial, which hopefully you're all familiar with, that very clearly showed a benefit to lung cancer screening uh, in the very uh, important measure of lung cancer mortality. In fact, uh, I don't know how, what, how familiar you are with clinical trials, but when we design a clinical trial where we're randomizing patients between the two arms, uh, we do that because we believe the two arms are somewhat the same. Um, that's called equipoise. We don't have a bias uh, that one is better than the other. If we did, it would be unethical to randomize patients to those two arms. And so when we do these trials, we build in a committee that's supposed to review the data every so often to make sure that really things are still undecided and it's still ethical to continue to enroll patients in this trial. And that was done for the National Lung Screening Trial. And it got to the point where that committee reviewed the data and said, well, you know, we now see a big difference, and it's time to stop the trial. So the trial was stopped early. And even though the trial was stopped early, they saw a decrease in death from lung cancer of 20%. Now, that's not an increase in detection of early lung cancers. That's not operating on more patients with early lung cancers. That's not disease-free survival of lung cancer. That's actual mortality rate from lung cancer, which is really the ultimate goal. We want to reduce the death rates from lung cancer. So there was a 20% reduction in a trial that was stopped early, which means that if you play that out across large populations, you will probably see an even greater reduction. 
And a lot of the people who know a lot about these things and think about these things um, came out and said this is really the greatest single advance in cancer treatment, period, any cancer treatment. And that's because lung cancer, of course, affects so many people. So uh, as a result of that, there's been a lot of interest and enthusiasm. We now have support from the federal government, the United States uh, task force that's designed to look at all these studies and decide what's appropriate and what's not appropriate as recommended lung cancer screening for appropriate eligible patients. Medicare covers it. Most insurance companies now cover it. Uh, but I want to emphasize lung cancer screening is not just a CAT scan. It's not like you have a colonoscopy or you have a mammogram and there is a finding and that's it. That's the screening test. Lung cancer screening is a program and that's because if you take all the patients considered at risk, and those are patients with a heavy smoking history or a history of cancer, and you do a CAT scan on them, half of them will have an, a nodule in their lung, 50%. But only 2% of them will actually have cancer, which means that the vast majority of nodules that we discover on a CAT scan in a patient at risk for lung cancer is not lung cancer. So we should not be recommending biopsies, recommending operations, recommending invasive tests that carry risk, potential complications, for the majority of patients who have a nodule picked up on their CAT scan. And that's why it's so important to have a program put together where you have a radiologist who are trained to read them and we have a very specific scale. For those of you maybe who've had mammography, you may understand that the, the radiologist will read your mammogram with a different graded scale. So in lung cancer, we now have what's called the lung RADS score. So the radiologist will score the scan based on degree of suspicion. Uh, and then that scan will be reviewed based on the particular findings about, well, this is something that is very low suspicion. We can follow you and get another scan in six months, or we can get another scan in one year. Or this is high suspicion. You really should be seen by a lung cancer expert who can recommend you get a PET scan, or you get a biopsy, or you get surgery. So these algorithms are very well worked out and requires really a multidisciplinary input into the results of the scan in order to decide what should be done, the right approach, uh, so that we avoid doing invasive procedures on people who really shouldn't have it done. And then, of course, the other dimension is the psychological one. You're at risk for lung cancer, you have a CAT scan, you get told you've got a nodule, that's an extremely stressful thing to do. And I've dealt with a lot of people who have to spend a lot of time reassuring them, I really don't think this is anything to worry about. You can go home, you can go to sleep. I'll see you in six months, everything will be fine. Um, because people, of course, are very stressed that they might have cancer and, and want it out that very second. So um, there's a lot involved in the counseling, uh, making the decision to have the screening test, then discussing the results. And then, of course, the other important component is smoking cessation. Somebody's actively smoking, they're at risk for lung cancer. Not only do you want to screen them for their lung cancer, but what we don't want to happen is, okay, your CAT scan looks fine, you're clear, you don't have cancer, and they go home and say, well, I don't have cancer, so I can keep smoking. So an important <laughs> part of that program is making sure that patients are offered and enrolled in effective smoking cessation so that not only do they get help quitting smoking, but they get their appropriate follow-up at one year, two years, three years, and so on. Just because not only are we looking for a cancer when they first come in, but we want to pick up those cancers that will start to grow two or three years after they started into the program. So um, it's really a multifaceted program. And what I want to emphasize not only um, is that lung cancer screening works, it's effective, very effective, but that it's more than just having a CAT scan. Just having a CAT scan is not really a good screening tool. You have to have that scan within the context of a program that's designed to properly evaluate it so we get the most out of it. So, so I, Dr. Ryers, I just have a comment and then I'll bring the mic over to you on the screening. I think it's so important, um, Dr. Block, thank you for, for your excellent description. Um, I think it's important for the people in the room who are sort of past that point, right, but why is this relevant to you? Um, I, and, 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 and working with patients and caregivers and family members and friends of lung cancer patients, um, I think it's important because it offers up an opportunity for all of you to share this information to people who you know might be at risk. Um, because the, the percentage of people, as, as we, we talked about or Dr. Block talked about, that are actually getting screened versus the percentage of people that qualify, we're, we're not even touching um, the people that could potentially benefit from this. So I just wanted to, to make that comment, so thank you. Thank you. Uh,
And they have a question, I think. In, in the meantime, I only want to comment that this is very important as I'm running the topic. Um, as you know, as lung cancer advocates uh, we have well, here, we need to collect money for research for lung cancer. But the other aspect that we're talking about is lung cancer screening is that we do not have the patient's interest to be screened. We don't know. That's why it's extremely important we need your help as advocates. To give you an example, in Florida, we calculated at one point we need to screen 30,000 people. So there is 30,000 people that are above 55 year old that smoke more than 30 packs a day of uh, cigarettes, and they are in high risk of lung cancer. We have screening programs in all of our institutions, and we have not screened 30,000 people. You know, we're supposed to screen 30,000 people per year. And since we started to do this four or five years ago, we barely have screened probably three or 4,000 people. So for some reason, I guess, nobody's interested in screening, either the patients, the doctors, the relatives, that's why this is another very important topic that a patient advocates together with time, we're going to be building up and fighting to have it done. So we can save all of these people even before we have to start treatment. Yeah. You know? in, our, in our institution, we, um, in November, which is Lung Cancer Awareness Month, we actually give screening tests for free. And last year we did two. Two. Two, because they were free. <laughs> I mean, some of them because people were calling were not candidates because you have to have a certain yeah. smoking history. Yes. But also there's a huge stigma, and you are the best advocates for lung cancer because when people meet patients like yourselves who are doing well, who are looking forward to new things in their lives, then people are less scared. And I think there's a huge stigma that lung cancer is something that you did to yourself if you smoked, and you, so people don't want to find out. But I have to say, when I get my mammogram, I don't like it. They kind of squish you. They kind of freak out <laughs> you. You can get a lung cancer screening much more comfortably um, by getting a cast scan. So you, you know, I think people need to like lose the fear and um, and seek out and ask their doctors because I think a lot of primary doctors are not having these discussions with their patients. Well, in fact, um, when all of this controversy broke several years ago, the American Academy of Family Physicians actually recommended against it. Yeah. And the reason they recommended against it was because they felt that in the vast majority of community settings, um, patients would be getting scans that were not being properly read. Mm -hmm. They would have findings that would then lead them to the hospital where they would get biopsies and all kinds of invasive procedures. And that the downside, the consequences of having all of these things done when they were really unnecessary outweighed the potential benefit. So uh, that's one of the factors that we're, uh, we're dealing with, and that's why it's so important to have, to recognize that it's a program, it's not just a scan. Right. A question that mm -hmm. also So what are we feeling is the cause of lung cancer? Is it smoking? Is it genetics? Who, and who should be looking to get screened? Everyone or just the people who smoke? Right, so. Um, <laughs> or if it's like in my yeah. family. To answer your first question. I don't question, smoke, yeah. but. Um, I can't tell you how many people have died that, from lung cancer that didn't smoke, and those who did smoke also died of lung cancer. So who are, who's, who, which people are at risk? Uh, so to answer your first question, the cause, it's all of the above. Um, cigarette smoking, of course, environmental exposures, uh, and also genetics. Uh, we know that 20% of lung cancers occur in people who never smoked. Uh, now, is there uh, exposure from secondhand smoke? Some of them, but some of them have no known exposure risk factors. Uh, and that's a real challenge, because in order to have an effective screening tool, um, you know, if you look into the epidemiology, you can't just do a CAT scan on everybody, because that is doing uh, tests on a large number of people who will never have any benefit from it. In order to really see the benefit of screening, you have to first um, pick out a group of people that are high risk. That's where you really see the benefit. And that's why the screening now is recommended for patients who are at high risk. And that definition is 30 pack years smoking history, active smoker quit within 15 years, ages 55 to 75, 55 to 80. Um, that's where the studies have been done. Outside of those parameters, we don't have the data to say that screening a population is beneficial. Um, there are, of course, patients who feel they're at higher risk because of a close family member who is a non-smoker, their twin sister had lung cancer, a variety of other factors that affect any individual's decision. Um, and for those patients, I would recommend, well, not even patients, but for those people, I would recommend that they have a conversation with their provider or somebody who knows lung cancer 
to discuss the, the upsides and downsides of getting a scan. Um, it's pretty simple, it's pretty easy, it's a very low dose radiation. The CT that we use for lung screening is about the same amount of radiation as a mammogram. It's less than your standard CAT scan. So the risk of the procedure itself is very low. The downside is what are you going to find and then what are you going to do as a result of that because most of what you find doesn't need anything done, creates emotional stress and so forth. So somebody who's at high risk but doesn't fall into that category is probably going to have to pay out of pocket. Insurance is not going to cover it. Medicare is not going to cover it. And they need to make sure that they have a discussion with somebody who understands lung cancer about what they're going to do with the results. Are they going to have one scan? If it's clear, they're going to think they're free for 10 years and never worry about it? Are they going to come back in a year? If they find something, what are they going to do about it? How aggressive are they going to be? Um, that's a conversation that really deserves that one-on-one. -on -one. It's not really appropriate for the population at large. So we can't go out there and say everybody who has a first-degree family member with lung cancer is at risk and needs to have a screening CT. But many of those people will feel the need to at least have the conversation. What are the nodules that you're finding, the benign nodules? So if you look in the textbook of medicine on the page that describes lung nodules, the list is about 50, 60. It's the entire page of things that can cause nodules in the lung. Uh, most of them are non-cancerous. Most of them are little bits of scar tissue from an old infection or an old bronchitis or an old pneumonia. Sometimes it's an enlarged uh, lymph node that we see. Uh, there are a variety of non-cancerous tumors, something like uh, hamartoma, for example. Um, those are less common, but we still see those. Uh, and then depending upon where you live, for example, if you live in the central part of the country, the Mississippi River Valley, uh, there's a certain type of fungal infection that's endemic to those areas, and so people who take care of lung cancer patients and do x-rays in that part of the country know that a lot of the nodules that show up are going to be this type of fungal infection. Same thing for people who are from the southwest of the United States. There's a different type of fungal infection that's endemic to that area. Um, people who have emphysema who are at high risk are also at risk for frequent lung infections, and so they will get scarring and pneumonia and all kinds of uh, different changes in their lung that may look like cancer but are not. Dr. There's all this, um, I was going to mention that there's all this very exciting research in understanding nodules with artificial intelligence, like computers mo doing modeling and telling you which nodules will become cancer. So there's going to be, a, I think looking forward, the technology will be better, like we'll have better screening CAT scans that will kind of stratify for those nodules that are more solid, more worrisome, and should be followed more closely. So I think there's a lot to come. Yeah. Well, I think there's also, there's also a lot of very interesting research on um, complementary screening tests, mm -hmm. blood tests, breath analysis, dogs that can smell cancer. I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable the things that are, that are being done that will complement mm -hmm. uh, all of these tools. Yeah, well, for now, we, we emphasize the CAT scan screening because this is a tool that is proven and we have now. But as Dr. Block said, it's not perfect. And we hope that maybe three years from now, we don't have to talk about that. Maybe we can talk about some blood tests or some breath tests. But for now, it's very important that uh, we, you know, we try to make this uh, knowledge uh, totally wide, open to everybody. No? Somebody had a question there? No. I was just curious if the insurance, I was just curious if the insurance companies are getting on board with screening. Uh, I don't remember exactly how long ago it was, but I had you mentioned free CAT scans. I got one of those free CAT scans. They found a nodule. They told me to come back in six months. Meanwhile, between that, I went to my primary doctor. He did a chest x-ray. He said everything's fine. But when it came time to go back to get another CAT scan, my insurance company said, no, we're not paying for it. I'm just curious if the insurance companies are getting on board with it. No, the insurance are not getting on board with that, unfortunately. Yeah. No. Because I have a lot of patients that are being rejected unless they don't, they, they lose the criteria. If the criteria is not in the history, they, they, you have to pay on that. Uh, but I think that, let me see, uh, I, but Boca will do it for 100, 150, okay. something like that. Yeah, but for that, that it's not covered. If, if, the indication, well, if the indication is not there, as Dr. Uh, Block, uh, Block uh, described, they don't cover it. Well, yeah, that's what I mentioned earlier. If yeah. you fall into that criteria, 55 to 75, 55 to 80, smoking history, then most insurance companies, including Medicare, will cover it. If you don't meet those criteria, then you're going to have to pay out of pocket. 
Now, if you find something, like you find a nodule, the insurance company should pay for a follow-up CAT scan for the specific indication of follow-up for a lung nodule. But if it's just for a screening test and you don't meet the criteria, then it, you're going to have to pay out of pocket for it. Yeah. Well, I yeah. can't. That. Well, <laughs> no, I think, I think it's a process, you know, because uh, the study that Dr. Bloch mentioned is a five-year-old. I guess the insurance take their time to learn the knowledge and approve, you know, and as more time they take, better for them. So that's why uh, a lot of times, a lot of these new developments uh, is popular pressure from the patients and the doctors. So that's why the, the process to implement and get full insurance approval is taking too long. And uh, in the meantime, all of our cancer centers are breaching, you know, doing, uh, we are doing $50, you know, that she's doing for free, he does 150 But the fact is the patients don't show up, you know, and that's what we don't understand. Why don't take advantage of this, I think, is the knowledge that I, all, of, uh, all of you have to help us to say this saves lives. A CAT scan screening, 20% is more beneficial than a mammogram or a pap smear. So that you can see what is the importance of this. Mm -hmm. You know, 20% benefit from a CAT scan from a high-risk smoker is more beneficial than a mammogram and a pap smear that for all of us, oh my, that needs to be done, you know? So that's something to give you an idea of uh, how this is working. There's uh, also a need for education of the primary care physician. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they are the ones seeing everybody and they are the ones that they actually could just easily yeah. pinpoint and suggest the screening yeah. test. Now that Dr. Montero <laughs> mentioned that topic, one of the things that I listen from my colleagues around the country is like, for some reason, you know, the healthcare is uh, promoting more and more palliative care and this and that. You know, when you see a patient with cancer, immediately to call palliative care instead of giving the patient a chance to meet an oncology. So we go through that because a lot of things has changed in oncology in the last two, three years and more good things to come. So I think that at least every patient with cancer, regardless if it's lung cancer or any kind of cancer, deserve a consultation with a medical oncology. We have a question for Dr. Batero. Yes, Dr. Batero, um, with regard to your uh, SBRT and radiation treatments, how many times can you radiate one lung um, for different tumors before the lung gets really damaged or causes more cancer or whatever? Well, the, let me just ask you the last part, that if it causes more, more cancer or not. Uh, traditionally, also radiation has been said that it causes a second cancer. Yeah. But uh, that's typically more common um, and very, very low incidence. When we treat, uh, like, a, for example, lymphomas of the chest, low dose radiation, and that, co that goes over the uh, developing breast. But actually, the incidence of a second malignancy is in uh, adults and, you know, uh, regular us. Um, is extremely, extremely low. Um, so when you have the benefit of some procedure, I say it always to my patient, everything is benefits versus side effects. And when you have the benefit here and the very extreme um, um, possibility of develop a second cancer is kind of um, out of question, you know? Now, um, the other one, how many times do we radiate? Uh, remember that I was talking about synchronous and metachronous um, uh, metastasis. If we're talking about um, um, oligometastatic uh, disease and the patient presents with one in the brain, one in the lung, one in the abdomen, one in the bone, um, up to maximum of six lesions, we're not going to treat it one after the other. We basically, we get what we call the index lesion or maybe the one that is the largest one, the one that is causing more problems, more pain or whatever. We treat that, we continue, let, it, let the patient continue in the systemic therapy. And if we work as a team, the patient will come back. We treat the second one and keep going. Now, patients that present with multiple, multiple nodules or multiple metastases in the lungs, we don't treat them, uh, all of them. Especially, we have to evaluate how is the pulmonary uh, function. But again, this type of radiation is so precise that we're talking about less, the precision of the machine is less than 0.1 millimeter. So when, you, when we delineate the target and we gave basically three millimeters margin around just to be treated, it's totally the opposite of the radiation that you delineate the tumor and you gave one and a half centimeter around just not to miss the target. Because you have to understand that when we treat the patient, you cannot tell the patient, hold your breath for half an hour, right? So the patient is breathing, and we ask the patient norm breathe normally. 
But these um, robotic machines are so good that they not only follow uh, and learn how you're breathing, and it could be very easy for uh, one of us, but patients with a COPD, um, the other day I have a patient that have a sleep apnea, and I saw these two more jumping from here to here, you know, like a big difference. Um, so these machines learn how to, um, uh, the pattern of breathing, and follow the, and traces the tumor, depending in which part of the face of the breathing um, the patient is at that moment, that he's kind of um, uh, targeting uh, the tumor, but also, traces the, we call it the fiducial marker, that is like a little gold markers that, that Dr. Block or sometimes interventional radiologists place in the tumor. So it's both, it's the, 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 the face of the breathing plus tracing the fiducial marker. Now there's patients that the quality of, or the pulmonary function tests are not that good. And uh, sometimes they, if you put them at risk to, um, put the fiducial marker and for whatever reason Dr. Block said, no, I cannot uh, put it out. And he will explain a little bit more maybe how he placed the fiducial markers um, with uh, endoscopically. When, but when the patient is at risk for developed pneumothorax and they have very limited pulmonary function tests, basically you know that that patient is gonna be um, in the mechanical ventilation forever, right? So the machine also can trace the density of the mass of the tumor and trace the density of the mass. So typically we treat probably two, three, four, five, depending if they are synchronous or metachronous. If they are metachronous, I think, um, I cannot really quote for a, a specific paper, but um, uh, I know that in our institution we have a patient that we have treat 10 in a, in a five years. In the term. same lung? In the, so in the lung, in, the, in both lungs. In both lungs, How many yeah. Times the we can re-radiate the same tumor if it's regrowing, okay? The good thing about this is the, if it's close to the heart, if it's close to the main airway, if it's close to the uh, ribs, we can uh, still treat it. We, we kind of uh, lower the dose or fractionate instead of one fraction or three fraction, we gave five. Um, but um, there's not really magical number. It depends how the patient is doing and how it's responding uh, to the immunotherapy. So if the patient is in good performance status or decent performance status, if he's responding to immuno or the medical oncologist said, well, he failed this one, but I have this other uh, medication to give him, and the pulmonary function tests are still decent, um, then we proceed, we treat, um, you know, first one, uh, I would say probably three, four, or five, but it depends how they are presented and, and what type of patient we're talking about. We have treat patients that are oxygen dependent. And believe it or not, the patient looked at me and I'm just signing the plan of treatment. And by the end I said, how you feel? I said, I feel better. I've decreased the uh, liters of oxygen per minute, you know? So this type of stories is not for everybody, but, um, but I think that you have to look at the individual case. But the, the, the correct answer or the correct number, I don't think that is a number. It is more how they present, the size of the tumor, the multiple you know, options and how they are responding to immunotherapy. If they are metachronous, could be multiple. Obviously, I guess that after you know, a certain number, you start not thinking about, oh, beautiful plan, one target. We fuse all the treatments, meaning if you come in a period of time of two years, we fuse the images of the first treatment with the images of the second and the third one, we call it MIM. And then you see in the reality how much of that normal lung has been receiving radiation. But the stereotactic radiation therapy is totally different from the standard hyperfractionated radiation therapy Monday through Friday, 15 minutes on the table. Because the, num the, the amount of normal lung that we sacrifice when we treat with a stereotactic is minimal. Does it cause, a, can the radiation cause pulmonary uh, problems for breathing? Because it, can it make it worse? We're talking about the stereotactic? Yes. Yeah, a stereotactic could, um, you know, um, again, depends where the, the, the tumor is, the location of the tumor. But if we're talking about respiratory, um, specifically symptoms, it causes some local inflammation, okay? And um, some patients um, could experience a little bit of discomfort in the chest or a little bit of more cough, um, or um, even what we call a little bit of radiation pneumonitis that is like, a, like if you have a little bit of pneumonia, but uh, not really with an infection, like a little bit of low grade fever, a little bit of um, um, uh, discomfort for breathing. Um, but that radiation pneumonitis is significantly less than with the traditional radiation therapy. What is the, what is the incidence of pneumonitis on patients that receive re-irradiation? 
with in the same spot or in different spots? Same with SBRT. No, I, I typically said, um, and maybe Dr. Block would be in disagreement, but I typically said what is dead, uh, let's say that you have, typically with that dose of variation, it's very hard to see that the tumor regrow in the same spot. Well, what we probably we can see is that it's a marginal failure, meaning mm -hmm. in the outside, for whatever reason, um, the tumor tricus and it was a little bit, you know, and, and this is so specific target that if you miss five millimeters, the tumor might regrow in that specific um, part. But um, I will say that radiation pneumonitis is depending on the size of the tumor and the location of the tumor. We see more, um, more radiation pneumonitis the larger the tumor because you have to think three-dimensionally. So typically, stereotactic many years ago, 15 years ago, was designed for tumors that were less than three uh, centimeters. Now we're uh, treating tumors four, five, six centimeters. But when you start seeing that this big mass, uh, or either you gave the opportunity to immunotherapy or the target therapy to shrink the tumor and then treat them, because if you treat something that is four centimeters, you give three millimeters around, and you think three-dimensionally, that's a big part of the lung. So it's um, tumor size, location. There's some areas of the lung that, um, that um, um, typically present with a little bit more radiation pneumonitis, that is the lower part of the lung. Um, and obviously, if you have two nodules contiguous, then eventually you're not having two millimeters and two millimeters, but the plan of treatment will end up having like a four or five, right? But I think so, the challenge, I guess I will say that the challenge is that because we can do it, doesn't mean that it's right for every patient because we, are, we have learned that there's this whole concept of clonal evolution. Like sometimes people, especially in targeted therapy, they will have one area that changes and it's changing because that is the area that is changing. The genes of that, that nodule are changing. And then sometimes radiation is very useful, but sometimes you have to biopsy again the patient, specifically the area that's growing, so you can pick a better therapy. And we've seen that with EGFR uh, and ALK and ROS and all these targeted therapies, that you have to kind of, kind of step back and see, okay, should we radiate or should we understand what's happening uh, right now to this patient because we could pro potentially change the therapy for the better. Yeah. So, but that's, that's, um, that's also another important point. When you ask for the... Um, for biopsy of something that is suspicious, either for first time or metastasis, um, ideally you should drop the fiducial because even if, you are, if your intention is not to treat at the beginning because you want to give the opportunity to the immunotherapy show if it's working or not, mm -hmm. right? Um, then you don't have to bring the patient. If you decided to treat that patient, you don't have to bring the patient back for a CT scan guided fiducial marker mm -hmm. placement or for, um, you know, for more procedures yeah. is a necessary extra risk. But I want Dr. Block to com comment because it's very important that some patients that are really borderline, uh, either because the pulmonary function tests are not the best to do a CT guided placement of the fusion marker or because of the location of the, um, of the nodule um, cannot be reached by interventional radiologists. If you don't mind just to comment about how is the processes for those patients to have in the, uh, broncos be a bronchoscopy or a, um, mm -hmm. Sure, I'd be happy to. I think, you have. Uh, I think the, the important point is to consider it within the context of trying to do the most efficient uh, workup to get the patient a diagnosis, the appropriate staging and treatment with as little <coughs> interventions as possible. So if a patient is coming in with a new diagnosis or a new suspicion of a lung cancer, um, there are a couple of different approaches. One is, well, we can biopsy the nodule and you see it's cancer. Okay, then you do a PET scan and then there's activity someplace else and then we biopsy someplace else to see if that's cancer. Okay, that's not cancer. Now this is early stage. Oh, the patient's not a candidate for surgery. Now we gotta do another procedure to put a fiducial in so they can go for radiation therapy. And, you know, six weeks down the road and five tests later, they're finally ready for treatment. So what Dr. Batera is talking about is that um, we can combine a number of those procedures with uh, a single procedure, an endoscopic procedure, where we put a camera down into the windpipe, uh, either the windpipe or the esophagus, and we can evaluate lymph nodes using needle biopsy, using an ultrasound needle biopsy, so we can get a sample from the lymph nodes and stage the cancer. Um, if that turns out to be negative, we can then use a tool called navigation where we use a computer modeling to help us navigate the tip of the bronchoscope out into the part of the lung where the tumor is sitting. We can then take a biopsy of the tumor and at the same time we can leave behind one of these little gold markers. We use gold because it's extremely dense. 
So a little tiny piece of gold is very easy to detect with a simple x-ray. Uh, and so we'll leave a couple little of these gold markers behind where the tumor is so that if all the tests come back and it turns out that stereotactic radiation is part of the approach, the patient already has all of the tests done, has the marker in place. We don't need to send them back for a CT guided biopsy or another biopsy or another needle placement. Uh, it all gets done at the same setting. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, one of the advantages of trying to um, efficient, make a very efficient workup and use one tool or one suite of tools to get everything done uh, at the same time. Great. So now I want to take advantage to talk a, lot, a little bit of navigation. Can, can you explain the importance of navigation for our patients? Uh, before I begin, um, I would like to ask all of you, how many times have you wondered what's the next step to do after you have seen your oncologist? Um, or to ask um, to, if it's possible to speak with somebody about the anxiety that you have for the upcoming biopsy, or um, how can you get some help to start the treatment, the next treatment, as soon as possible? Or um, how can you find out about the side effects of the current treatment that you're taking? How can you report your side effects, whatever symptoms you have, in a timely manner? Or um, what other services are available at Memorial Cancer Institute, and how can you benefit from them? Or what other clinical trials are available for the type of cancer that you have? Or, you know, these are questions that we all can relate to, because many times patients come to us and they ask these kind of questions. And uh, I would like to emphasize the, um, for the patient navigation, the patient navigation and our role, our goal is pretty much to anticipate and recognize and address the barriers that you might have and encounter in a, for the timely diagnosis, for treatment, to help patients to attain a better transition from one treatment to another, or to improve the timeliness of starting this treatment. So, we also provide educational support and function as a resource for you and for your uh, family as well, caregivers. As we mentioned, we have low-cost um, uh, screening tests for lung cancer. Periodically, we do have uh, resources for support groups. We have uh, uh, written material about uh, the type of cancer that you have or the molecular marker that you're interested in you know, that says in the pathology report that you might have, so, or liquid biopsies. So there are really few things that you might find out about from us. Um, another thing that's very important is that we reach out and we strengthen the communication with other uh, team of specialists, and we ensure they are aware about your particular needs for the pending tests and results. So let's say you have a biopsy or you have, I don't know, a PET, a PET scan and you feel like you, you need a, you know, a certain sedative before the test or you have an allergy, reach out to us so we can also discuss your needs with the patient, with a uh, team of specialists, okay? Also, um, as I mentioned, we have a lot of resources so uh, available for you. Uh, here I will emphasize the integrative medicine. We have yoga, free yoga for you and your uh, you know, significant others. We have cooking classes, we have book clubs, we have um, um, like mindfulness, uh, psychotherapy. There are a lot, a lot, a lot of resources that are available for you and sometimes I cannot emphasize more at, at one you know, encounter with you. But I want you to remember when you get home, there, there are some options out there for you when you feel like there's nothing there to help you, okay? And also, um, so we have a, very, a first Tuesday, a Tuesday of each month, we have a lung cancer support group. I haven't seen um, very high uh, you know, attendance over there. I'm not sure why. I really encourage you to get together and talk about those things. They are so beneficial, and I feel so great listening to, uh, to these options for you. So you can lower your anxiety, and you feel like you empower yourself. You know, There are things out there that can help you. And also, um, the bottom line is that we empower you, but we also want you to feel informed, prepared, and getting the, the need, the support that you need. And um, our uh, team 
will actually help you one on one if you need to. Just reach out to us over the phone and we can guide you through the process and help you achieve the best care and experience uh, at Memorial because we obviously we are stronger together. Question. I have a question here. Uh, I was going to ask Dr. Block, actually more of a statement. Uh, when you were talking about fungal, you know, we go into detail, mm -hmm. that's actually what, they, what the doctor originally thought I had. It was another two years later, and had that been small cell, I probably wouldn't be sitting down here right now. It was two years later they finally did the biopsy because I wasn't in the risk factors. And like you said, the insurance company said, well, I never smoked a day in my life. None of my family members had cancer, et cetera, et cetera. They said, that was probably a fungal thing. We'll do some this and that, and, and then nothing got done. Then two years later, when they did the biopsy, I had a really nasty cancer. So I, I just figured I'd expound on that. Well, I think that speaks to the uh, value of a lung cancer screening program. Now, of course, you weren't at high risk, so you weren't in that program. But one of the things that the programs do is develop a, an algorithm to try and maximize the likelihood of picking up a cancer early and minimize the likelihood of doing unnecessary testing. So for a nodule, if we think it's not cancer, we still recommend fairly short-term follow-up, three months, if it hasn't changed in three months, six months, if it hasn't changed in six months, a year. So that, um, I mean, obviously I, I'm not privy to what happened in your particular case, um, but two years is a long time um, to detect something and diagnose it, and one would hope that in the ideal circumstance, uh, a nodule that's even of low suspicion um, would be followed close enough so that at the first sign of suspicion, uh, there would be a little bit more invasive testing done. Question. Um, thank you. The, um, regarding uh, early diagnosis, uh, we're talking about CT screening for uh, high-risk patients. Uh, what about liquid biopsies? What is the current specificity and sensitivity for the liquid biopsies? In, in, in what stage, the early stage early or the late stage? stage. <laughs> Where? Early or early stage? stage? Early, for uh, screening. Say early. No, so for the screening, no, I guess. Yeah. Uh, for the screening, the problem is this, uh, the technology is becoming uh, such a good technology that uh, you have to be careful. For example, we're very excited about liquid biopsy. So uh, some of you have liquid biopsy. Liquid biopsy means that we draw, we draw your blood, we isolate a piece of tumor, <laughs> and we do a molecular marker so you can have a pill. You know that we can also find tumor in all of us. So that's the problem, yeah. okay? All of us, 10% of us, if we draw blood now, we have tumor in the blood. Doesn't mean that we have cancer. Only means that our body is fighting cancer. And that's what happens every day. Every day you develop lung cancer, leukemia, myeloma, something, and the body clears. The problem with liquid biopsies is if we, if we draw the blood, and you find the cancer, of course you get scared, but we don't know if you're going to develop the cancer yet or not. That's why that technology needs to be uh, uh, improved, so one day we can really draw the blood and use it as a screening tool so we don't have to be doing maybe CAT scans. Mm -hmm. That's why today we only recommend to have liquid biopsies and genetic tests when you already have a diagnosis of lung cancer. It's too risky to draw the blood um, if you are, don't have the diagnosis because you may get confused, you may get stressed, and you know, you may not have cancer. The, the, the tumor that we can isolate tonight can be clear three days from now. So you say it would be currently specific enough to restage a, a cancer patient? No, that's why one day when it's specific enough, so if we found we know that you will have cancer for sure, uh, what I'm telling you is a true story, you know, in the New England, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, they put, uh, they draw blood in 10,000 patients, not 10,000 10, volunteers, mm -hmm. and 10% uh, and of them have cancer. In the blood, none of them have cancer in real life. Two, two more DNA of yeah, cancer. Two more yeah, DNA. two more DNA. DNA. Yeah, that's why the caution is, hopefully one day when we isolate this tumor in the blood, we'll say, oh, this is really a bad character because this is not going to be killed by the immune system. This is the one that we have to really believe it. For now, we don't have that technology yet. That's why we have, uh, we always tell you that use things properly. The standard of care now is we only do liquid biopsy once that you have a needle that for sure guarantees that you have lung cancer. Mm -hmm. 
and, and even and even if you have lung cancer, we don't do that if the patient have early stage, unless we are going to put the patient into a clinical trial. Because if you have early stage and you have one of those mutations, you may not qualify for a clinical trial if you don't have certain criteria. Because that tumor will be taken out by Dr. Block. Okay? And we know that you have a mutation, then what to do? Okay, so it depends. <coughs> not all those patients qualify for entering into a clinical trial. So we don't even do liquid biopsy in those patients. So I would, I would just add to that, um, the way to think about it is not that you don't qualify for the trial. In other words, you don't meet the criteria to benefit from the trial. It's that your particular presentation means that you would not benefit from the trial. It's, mm -hmm. it's not that you don't qualify for it. It's that there's right. no yeah. benefit to you. Don't, don't do it. It's not going to help. So even though you may have this mutation or you may have this finding, there's no data, no evidence to suggest that you're going to benefit from it. So don't enroll in it. That's why you're not qualified for it. So it's, there's, it's a subtle difference in the way you look at it. It's not that you're being denied an opportunity to have a benefit because you don't meet certain criteria. It's because we're not treating you with something that is of no benefit. Well, it would be interesting to see if you use liquid biopsy already had primary lung cancer for any secondary cancers that they may develop that are iatrogenic. So I think um, the way to think about it is that cancer is a very complicated disease with lots of genetic mutations. One mutation in one cell does not cause cancer. You have to have lots of mutations over and over and over again before you actually get a cancer. So when we do these blood tests, we're looking for specific mutations, and you can detect those mutations. That doesn't mean the patient has cancer. And in fact, the vast majority of the time, they don't have cancer. So it's like the screening CT scans. You get a lot of false positives. And all those false positives can lead to a lot of problems, especially if you start doing testing, invasive procedures, you wind up causing a lot of harm, a lot of emotional stress, when there's really no benefit to be gained at all. So I think, I mean, I think we first have to answer the question if these interventions help after surgery. So the largest trial, um, adjuvant trial that is ongoing in the United States is the Alchemist trial. And I encourage you, if you know people that are going through this, to really participate in these trials because we will need to screen 10,000 people that got stage 1B to 3 lung cancer adenocarcinomas to find a group of patients that had this EGFR or ALK mutations that we can now answer the question, does it make a difference if you get a pill if you had that mutation? And it's going to take us a long time, but the sooner we get people screened and people agree to participate uh, in this trial, which is not, um, it requires that you get your tumor tested, not the blood. So, and since you already had surgery, it's not a big, uh, it's not onerous on the patient because you're just getting the tumor tested. But, you know, patients, you know, these this clinical trials are harder and harder to enroll for many reasons, but they're really, really important because if you have the technology but you don't know if the intervention helps, it doesn't really move the science. Yeah, I want to bring again the topic of immu immunotherapy. So immunotherapy is, is going back to the adjuvant setting after surgery. Uh, and in that trial that she is uh, telling, there is another arm that was included this year to put also patients on immunotherapy if you are EFR negative or ALK negative. So some people will go on immunotherapy. And there are also clinical trials, you know, sponsored by some companies also in that, in that setting. And there are so encouraging results of immunotherapy being used before surgery, okay, with very good response, very good pathological response, and so that is coming up. And then perhaps before we send the patient to Dr. Block, we discuss that in a team, and we may decide who patient should receive immunotherapy out from surgery, and then send the patient to the cardiothoracic, uh, to the thoracic surgeon for resection. So there's a lot of things coming up in that, in that field. Yeah, we have a question there. Yeah, I have a question. So, so far we have immunotherapy, radiology, Target therapy, oh, the pills. Therapy. Target therapies, yeah. gene therapy. Yeah. No, that's different. No, that's different. But yeah. And how far we are of the nanotherapy? Nano is been around forever, but no. <laughs> those little tiny bots. Yeah, the yeah. tiny bots. Uh, it's been around forever. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. No, we uh, for for we don't have. Any utility, I think, yet for, for nanotherapy, but uh, you know, nanotherapy is these tiny things that they fix things for you. Well, basically, it's like a, yeah. it's like a bullet that's yeah. going to go directly to the tube. Yeah, no, we haven't made it work yet, and maybe one of the reasons is um, 
if you have to fix something tiny, you can create a tiny, tiny machine that goes there and fix it. But as Dr. Block said, the problem with the human body is it's such an amazing amount of mechanisms that there is no, it's never one, only one. That's why, for example, that's why vaccines don't work for lung cancer. Because for the flu, you identify what is the piece of the flu that you need to develop the vaccine. You make the vaccine. Of course, we never make the right vaccine. And then you give the, <laughs> you give the vaccine, and sometimes it works, sometimes no. But you, you, you think that there is a, a piece. But for example, for pneumonia or for herpes zoster, we know what is the piece of the bug that we need to engineer, and we fix it. But lung cancer is a bunch of antigens that that's why we, we have tried tons of vaccines and nothing works because it's, it's more complex than only one vaccine, one target, one antigen. That's what makes lung cancer such a difficult disease. So. But, but the checkpoint inhibitors and this kind of thing may resuscitate the vaccines. Because when we take a vaccine, the, immune, the, the, the body responds. There is an immune response. Yes. The problem is that the immune response is shut down in the microenvironment by the tumor cells. So now there will be clinical trials combining these vaccines with the checkpoint inhibitors. There is a tons of clinical trials ongoing in that, that space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hi. Uh, I'm really interested in the immunotherapy. Um, I had stage two lung cancer. Dr. Block operated on me about three months ago. So I'm really new to this game. Um, I'm in a clinical trial in the control group. I know the FDA has approved for the um, stage three and the stage four lung cancer, and the clinical trial is for the stage two. I was just, and I know it's got several more years to go. I was just wondering if they find that in the ongoing trial that has been going for a year or so, that they've had great results. Will they stop it and will they? Go right and, and approve it because it's been approved already for the stage three and yeah, stage problem like Cut is, it short and put it out. The problem is uh, uh, that we have to be sure that it works. And uh, you are correct. So the, the drugs apparently are safe because we already use for stage three and four. But we already have had bad experiences in the past, especially with the pills. You know, we have a lot of pills now. Oh, you know, if it works for stage four, you have work for you. You know, there is nothing to lose. Take a pill after surgery. And unfortunately, uh, people live less. You know, we, we, there was a study like six, seven years ago after surgery. We pick up one of these pills that we use for stage four that works. And we gave to half of the patients the pill, half of the patients placebo. The people on placebo live 10 more months than the people on the pill that works. Why that mystery? What that happened? We don't know. So that's why we became more cautious, okay? And, and we are really want to implement these things if we really are sure that the patients are going to benefit. So in, in, in your study, I think it's Alchemist, there are a lot of safeguards. So like every, every certain amount of time, as Dr. Block said, there is a committee. Mm -hmm. And the committee meets. And the committee decides if with the current information, we should stop the study or not stop the study. For example, I'm in one of these committees of Alchemist, we just decided that we are going to add a new drug so you guys can benefit from it. No, because everybody at the beginning, if you qualify for pills, we give you pills. If you don't qualify for pills, we don't give you anything. But now that we have immunotherapy, we added immunotherapy as an option. And soon we will be adding other drugs so the, all the patients can benefit of one of these interventions. But we have to be sure that really you are going to have a benefit and it's not going to be detrimental for you. And don't worry. It's very ethical. So if at some point, like happened in the study, Dr. Block explained, we discovered that uh, people on the immunotherapy are living longer, the study will stop. Well, I understand that people with stage three and stage four cancer have cancer. And the people with stage two cancer who have been operated on, well, that's iffy. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Okay, but that's exactly the point. Right. I understand. A, a lot of you are maybe cured. So there's no reason to put you on treatment. The problem with stage four is that they are not cured, so they need treatment. But the problem with stage three, or stage one or two, is that a lot of you are already cured. You don't need anything. Actually, for you guys, the best thing to do, honestly, instead of discover anything, is to discover a scanner. So after you leave the Dr. Block room, you know, after surgery, we scan you. 
You are clean. You don't even have to come to meet us. You don't need chemo. You don't need anything. Well, the control but, group does But that. we don't have that machine yet. Unfortunately, the PET scan can only see seven millimeters. So you maybe end your surgery. Dr. Block doesn't see anything. And you are going home with three tumors that are one millimeter. Seven so that's why we give you chemo after. You know, that's what we put you on these studies. So that's why, the, 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 for me, the most important thing is to discover the scanners that we can do before, after surgery so we can spare you chemo. And it's, not, it's the same for lung, for breast, for colon. All of these patients that have surgery, they have to endure chemo. In, in, in breast cancer, it's the, the amount is the tremendous amount of people that have to endure chemo without, without even knowing if it's going to benefit or not, you know? Scans for seven years. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to comment, although uh, we need more data on that, but the, the FDA has approved, you know, after surgery, there is data on circulating tumor cells, CTC, that has been correlated with prognosis, okay? So the patient goes for surgery, uh, re, uh, CTCs are analyzed prior to surgery, patient receives adjuvant therapy, and then we can check CTC and see uh, if that CTC disappears. The problem is that if the CTC disappear, doesn't disappear, what, what, what we tell the patient, that's why we don't do that routinely. But there is a way, a way how to, to see, perhaps, or to have an idea on the prognosis of the patient, perhaps to make more surveillance closer to those patients that went for surgery. But again, the technology advanced so quickly that we cannot run those clinical trials as fast as the technology. And as my colleagues mentioned, um, the, we need to wait because the first rule in medicine is not to harm. Okay, safety is the most important uh, thing. And although uh, we would like to do it, we will need to uh, put ourselves in the patient's uh, shoes and say, what happened if something bad happened to the patient and died from toxicity, and maybe the patient was cured, as Dr. Rae said. So um, unfortunately, again, the technology is faster than what we can do uh, in terms of clinical trials. We have an online question. So Dr. Rodriguez, um, can you speak to women and the Lung Cancer League, especially ones like this woman who's asking uh, with no risk factors, no major markers? Um, so thank you for the question. So we are seeing um, a, what is called a growing epidemic of non-smokers uh, with lung cancer, mostly adenocarcinoma, and many of them are women for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the smoking epidemic, or, or not the exposure to smoking for those, there's some that are smokers, and they were seeing the, the lung cancer effects decades later. Uh, but for the ones that are non-smokers, some of these genetic changes like EGFR um, all over the world have been found more in women. And we don't really understand what is the exposure, what is it about your genes that is triggering that. But we do know that uh, women um, don't tend to pay attention to their symptoms because they're paying attention to other people in their family and their symptoms. But I think it's important that people recognize that they need to go to a doctor if they're coughing and the coughing doesn't go away, if they have chest pain and it's not going away. Um, I'm always surprised at people that are losing weight and, and, and feeling sick and just staying at home for months and months and months. So I think it's important for women to recognize that lung cancer is a problem, that it can happen even if you never smoked and if you have symptoms, those have to be recognized and brought to the attention. And, Hopefully in the future we'll understand. They have looked at the estrogen receptor to see if that's what plays a role and that hasn't really answered the question. Um, I know in Asia they have done trials looking at cooking oil exposure and see if there's an exposure that women have. Uh, but we know that um, genetically um, these are also in the world divided. Like in Asia, if you practice in, in California where there's a lot of uh, patients of Japanese descent and Asian descent, you'll see a higher rate of adenocarcinomas that carry these mutations. So some of it is genetic, some of it has to do with who you are um, ethnically. Um, but also I think at the, at the end of the day, it's in first to recognize that it can be a problem for women and that women need to br bring their symptoms to the attention of their doctor. Mm -hmm. Do, do we have time for so, one more question? So I, well, what I was, uh, not really. <laughs> this has been great, though. All the questions, it's been fantastic. I love, I love the way this, this, this has happened tonight. I'd like maybe some final thoughts from each of you, and then we'll go ahead and okay. close out. Final thoughts. Final thoughts. And if you have any, if you don't, that's okay. No, no, no. I have many thoughts, but. Uh, um, Marina, if I want to kind of leave the what message to I want to leave, I, I would say that among all the things, you know, new technology, new medications, staging, screening, and everything, is just like um, 
um, work as a team, you know, not only education, but work as a, as a team. Um, I really want to stress, like uh, for the navigators, um, just the coordination on the treatment for the patient from the moment of the um, uh, diagnosis and all the processes, because if it's with lack of coordination, the patient is like a lost uh, piece on the space and it's just like a bumping and losing precious time. Um, so there's nothing really wrong with second opinions. You know, if you feel comfortable with your doctor and you are already even started the, the, the treatment, there's absolutely nobody should be mad if you said I want a second opinion. Even if you eventually decided to stay with the same doctor. But um, it's the, your, your own life and you really need to get, you know, at the moment, at the precise moment, the right uh, decision. So I really think that uh, programs like a Mount Sinai, like a Baptist, like a UM, like a Memorial, they have nurse coordinators that really um, bring everybody together and, come in, in, uh, and allow you know, the flow of the treatment in the, in the results, of course, much better. Um, Oops, my, Mike, sorry. My message for, for you is to reach out to us and to go home and um, think about that we're there for you every day from 8 till 5 and even longer sometimes that we feel your pain we feel your anxiety we are there to help you and um, we will continue to support you with whatever you need uh, reach out to us again come to the support groups uh, ask questions what is integrative medicine what else can uh, can i get from you to help me with the, my pain my anxiety Report your side effects on time, you know, don't feel alone, don't stay alone because it's, it's better to, to communicate with us. So I, I would like to say that uh, we, we, we promise you this is a, a group of committed people that is going to dedicate the rest of their lives to fight this disease. And I hope before I die I can see the cure. And, uh, but we need your help from your side. Uh, you know, this is an amazing organization that's hosting us tonight, Bonnie Adario, with the help of all of these industry uh, partners. Um, but we need more people to get involved, um, to advertise the screening, the molecular markers, uh, why they send the patients to hospice without sending to an oncology consul at least to give them a chance, why they don't know about navigation, you know, why they don't know about stereotactic, and so why the patients that, har that fight harder live longer. They should not be like that, you know, we should have a system. This is an amazing nation, that's why we all, a lot, a lot came here. So this is the best nation of the, of, of the world. We should not be have to be doing each patient doing the extra mile to survive, but we should provide the best care. So that's why we need all of you, please, to give us a hand, get involved. Uh, we do a lot of activities in South Florida, too, uh, or nationwide. Um, in South Florida, for example, we have a 5K next month, um, September 16th, in Hollywood Beach. And uh, so we need your help to, and you know, the patients don't have to walk or run, you know, you can come and uh, some of us will try to run if we can, you know, and uh, so that's why we need your help, your support to build this cause uh, to fight lung cancer. Thank you. I want to thank you for having us here and also for being so brave. I think from the patient that was just diagnosed eight weeks ago to the patient that was diagnosed eight years ago, is your stories that move the science and push people to invest in research and give hope uh, to patients. And you know, we are so fortunate to be in an era where we're making a diff more of a difference for patients. And I think all these things that we do, just simple things like you know, calling your doctor earlier about your symptoms impacts survival, um, getting palliative care when you need it impacts survival, and participating in clinical trials. Uh, so thank you for inviting us. <laughs> yeah, uh, my final words are, uh, I agree with the second opinion. I always have seen that it's very open mind. When I have a patient in front of me, I always tell my patient, don't believe what I'm telling you, okay, but don't go also to Google because Google will tell you everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I always encourage my patient, go for second, third opinion. And I always ask my patient, where, we, where you would like to go? You want to go to the West, to the East, you want to go to Europe? We have connections. But the most important thing besides that is try to always ask for clinical trials. Uh, I work with every single thoracic oncology in South Florida, Estela Mari, Dr. Rice, uh, Bruno Bastos from Cleveland Clinic, and, uh, uh, Dr. Jan Hapsen from UM, Mudat from UM. So we always connect each other to see what clinical trials they are running that I don't have it. 
Like, for example, for n track, I don't have that in my institute, but I know that Dr. Rai has it. And similarly, when uh, I opened the Tagriso Simertini trial three years ago, I received patients from Dr. Rai and Dr. Esteban Mari there, and um, also from the uh, Baptist. And there are a lot of people from that, that trial three years ago that they are still alive with no evidence of disease. And it's very gratifying when I receive a call from Baptist, from Dr. Alvarez, telling me the patient is doing great. Okay, and they have a chance to go for a clinical trial. So this, you will need to go to someone like have this kind of, of thing, like open mind and clinical research. Okay, because it's the only way that you advance medicine. And the other thing is don't be afraid of clinical trial because as Dr. Block mentioned and Dr. Wright mentioned, it's not like that in the whole time. Now we have good, good, good therapy, like our standard of care. So I, as, uh, at least in my institution, what I always try to bring are trials that compete against the standard. So all my patients receive the standard, and the, the experimental group receive the standard for something new. So you will need to also balance all that. So I think that the issue sometimes of placebo, I think it's so difficult to put patients on placebo that, uh, uh, at this time because of what we have right now in lung cancer. I'm telling you, in this year, the National, cancer, uh, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, the NCCN, which basically reviewed the data from lung cancer, they have changed six times the guidelines in 2018. This is great. And just in ASCO, we have like four clinical trials positive for survival. So we are living an exciting moment. And I will tell my patient, just keep fighting, OK? We are going to be, be behind you. Because every day, week, month, year that pass by, more things are telling me. When I see my patients in my clinic, and patients of mine have uh, been seven years in Boca, and I saw them with me, I say, well, you haven't been exposed to anything that happened in the last seven, seven years. <laughs> but they are there for you when the time comes. Thank you. So uh, I like to say progress uh, depends on activism. And all of the developments that we've talked about tonight, all of these terrific therapies uh, required funding. And the funding, you know, none of this was for free. And the funding is based on activism. And activism really depends on survivors. The challenge that we've had with progress in lung cancer is that it's such a deadly disease that until recently there have been very few survivors. Not only that, there's the stigma of cigarette smoking and those two factors have really made it difficult to make progress with lung cancer. And so I'm hopeful that we are uh, attacking that on two fronts. First of all, I think we're overcoming a lot of the stigma associated with cigarette smoking. So survivors and people with lung cancer will feel less stigmatized if they come out and talk about their disease. And because of all the great therapies these doctors have, we now have more people surviving lung cancer. So not only do we have uh, the stigma fading away, but we also have more survivors. And hopefully the combination of those two will lead to more patients who feel more comfortable being activists. Because we can shout as much as we want and go to the NIH and, and tell them it's important, but they really don't listen unless the patients knock on their door and say, this is important, this is what we need. So I, I just want to leave you with that thought, that progress depends on activism, and activism depends on patience. Yeah. So, so I'm going to close um, with a few thank yous and, and acknowledgments. One, um, uh, first and foremost, to this amazing panel who came out here tonight um, um, to talk to you all and answer all of your very um, personal and specific questions. So thank you all very much for, for coming out. Um, I want to thank um, uh, our sponsors. I can't put on my glasses for this. So as I think Dr. Reyes mentioned, um, this, this meeting, this program, gets a huge amount of support from industry. Um, without their help, we could not bring this to you here um, or, or from California where, where we do it regularly. So a huge shout out to uh, AbbVie. Lilly, Medtronic, Merck, Novartis, Takeda, Celgene, Bristol Myers Squibb, Boehringer Ingelheim, AstraZeneca, Amgen, Genentech, and the Yahoo Employee Foundation uh, for enabling us to, to bring this to all of you. A thank you to the Beverly Boys Productions for coming out early today and setting up all of this equipment so we could bring it out to all of you uh, who are watching uh, from wherever you're watching from. And um, uh, the historic Maxwell um, House here. This place, how great is this place? I love, I love this space. Um, of all the sort of on the road living rooms that we do, this is the best space we've been able to find. So a big thank you to them. 
um, for staying out and, and supplying the food and the, and the um, event space for us. Most importantly to the patients and the caregivers and the family members, um, we, this, you are who we do this for. So thank you for coming out, for being a part of it, for being so actively engaged in this meeting tonight. Um, no, and all, thank you guys. Yeah. Thanks, really, Mara. Seriously. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, <laughs> And, and to Dr. Rise's point, come out on September 16th. There's flyers on all of your tables. It is such a fun day. Um, we do it. It's early because it gets so bloody hot here. But Dr. Santos, you have something to say? Before you finish, they, this is the part of the Adario Lung Cancer Medica Foundation. But let me tell you something that these people also do research. And there is a lot of institutions around the nation that we are part of the consortium. And we always connect every month. Okay, bringing new ideas. So it's not only what you do for the patient, but also they are fighting behind the scene on the clinical trial. Yes. Yeah. I, think, I think you're making me blush. Um, again, thank you all. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, please take cookies with you. There's a lot of cookies. Um, and feel free to hang out for a little bit because we've got, we've got a little bit of time left. Thank you. So good to see you. Thank you.